and thank you for joining us for an action-packed weekend of the GRC Virtual Summit. We know that community radio is a true beacon of democracy. With that, we'd like to thank our sponsors for their support for college and community radio, not only this weekend, but throughout the year. Pacifica Network, SCMS Broadcast Equipment Solutions, Spinatron, Broadcast Tool and Die, and MadPixel Art and Design. Individually, each of our stations has the power to save lives, energize voters, and comfort our neighbors in their time of need. Together, we can amplify cultures, start movements, and inspire new ways of life. With that, I would like to take a moment to introduce our keynote speaker, Ken Friedman. Ken is the station manager of WFMU, WFMU.org. It's the longest running and most renowned freeform radio station in the United States. Under his guidance, WFMU became an independent of Uppsala College, uh, the original owner. Friedman also developed WFMU's internet presence, making it one of the most popular and forward-looking internet radio stations in the US. WFMU was the first radio station to offer full on-demand listening podcasts and a working iPhone stream. Ken recently founded Conjura PBC, which is developing Audience Engine, an open source platform for small and medium-sized broadcasters and journalists. He previously founded the Free Music Archives, freemusicarchives.org, an online music library and social site based on curated music licensed under alternative copyrights, such as Creative Commons licenses. And he also pioneered the use of copyrights in waivers to address restrictions placed on broadcasters by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. He has served on the board of Public Science and Technology Company, New Brunswick Scientific Company, and was a board member and technology advisor to the National Federation of Community Broadcasters. Please welcome Ken Friedman. Thank you, Mary. And thank you also to Kate and Alan and Sharon and the rest of the crew at WXOX for putting together uh, this amazing conference. I'm really, really impressed with the uh, the bookings and organization um, on top of the uh, WXOX Art FM Brianna Taylor simulca simulcast, which was also amazing. Um, Art FM and WXOX really seem like they are on a roll. And, and hello to all the WXOX listeners. My name is Ken Friedman. I'm station manager and program director of WFMU. We're a radio station broadcasting out of Jersey City, New Jersey, uh, to the New York City region. Uh, and also all over the world online. The theme of my talk today is not about getting on the air, but about staying on the air. Um, and it's about some of the most challenging and uh, energizing and gratifying broadcast experiences that I've ever had, uh, which uh, ironically have happened during crises and emergencies. But I think it does make sense since radio, radio basically is community. Radio is a community builder and it's during crises and emergencies and natural disasters that communities come together, or at least that was true until this pandemic. This pandemic is different from all previous disasters in that it did not allow people to physically come together. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and start up a uh, little slideshow that I've got for you. There we go. Um, there's my email address if anybody ever wants to reach out, uh, but we'll also be having questions and answers at the end. It's really great to see so many of my friends and comrades in community broadcasting here. Um, I wish we were together in, in real life, but this is better than, than nothing. Um, I started at WFMU in 1983. Uh, this shows most of our broadcast area, although right now we, we, we have... Um, four stations in the New York area, uh, two full service stations and two translators. Uh, but despite the four FM stations, we still have more listeners online than we do over FM. Um, but I started off at FMU as a DJ, as a volunteer DJ in 1983. Um, although the first thing that struck me about WFMU at that time is that it didn't feel like a radio station. It really felt more like a club. Um, and in fact, it was kind of a club. This is a picture of the staff in 1969, long before I arrived, about 20 people, mostly white guys. Uh, they held down the station pretty much 24 hours. And that's more or less the way I 
found FMU when I joined the staff in uh, 82, 83. Um, I had come from WCBN in Ann Arbor, which was a really great student-run community radio station out of Ann Arbor. So my idea of radio was completely different than what I was finding um, at FMU. Although FMU at the time that I came there had incredible talent. It had some amazing DJs, many of whom were doing three or four volunteer shifts uh, a week um, because there were only 15 to 20 DJs. But the station was off the air a lot. If a DJ couldn't make it, the station just turned the transmitter off. Um, Uppsala College was running the station and they rented out huge chunks of broadcasting time every day to religious broadcasters. So it was, it was a kind of strange environment, although definitely populated with some of the most amazing radio talent that I had ever heard at that time. When I became station manager in 85, I think my first goal was that I wanted to improve the music department. Uh, I wanted to get the station on the air 24 hours a day. I wanted to diversify the staff as well as the music. Um, but mostly trying to keep the station on the air was the biggest challenge. And I think what we're gonna be talking about today is a little bit about my early days at FMU and trying to get the station uh, to stay on the air, to go 24 hours and stay on the air. Uh, <clears throat> and then we're gonna be talking about um, the time in 2005 that we helped uh, w our sister station, WWOZ in New Orleans, or Nor in New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina. I'll be talking a bit about uh, what happened when our licensee, the college that owned WFME went under and we had to become independent of the station. Uh, I'll be fast forwarding then to um, <clears throat> our own experience in 2007, or whenever, whenever 2012, whenever Hurricane Sandy was, I guess 2012. Um, uh, and then ending with uh, the current pandemic and what we're doing. Uh, but the first challenge when I became station manager was to keep the station on the air and uh, get us on the air 24 hours a day. And the biggest challenge we had at that time was making sure that our high fidelity dial up circuit, which was our studio transmitter link, our SPL, uh, didn't go out. But it went out quite a bit and we spent a lot of time broadcasting from the transmitter shack in the parking lot of the Mount Fuji Steakhouse restaurant. Uh, this was Matt Ostrovsky, one of our DJs. Uh, Pre-CDs, we would just bring a microphone and a Radio Shack realistic mixer up there, and we would just talk until the service was restored and we could broadcast from the studio again. Uh, when CDs came along, we started dragging up a couple of CD players. And the interesting thing I found when we broadcast from the Transmitter Shack, which was quite a lot actually, was that listeners would tell us later that we never sounded so good. That was how I learned that was any kind of studio transmitter link, any method of getting the audio from the studio to the transmitter is going to take a big bite out of the fidelity. So here we were just broadcasting from this crappy corrugated tin shack. Uh, <clears throat> you can see the fold up chair to the left. That was about the uh, extent of the niceties that we had up there. Um, but we sounded great whenever we were broadcasting from the shack because we were literally plugging a little mixer a little realistic $15 mixer directly into the transmitter uh, processor. Um, this happened a lot that we had to broadcast from the shack. Uh, that chair sitting at the bottom of the tower was reserved for anybody who wanted to experiment with uh, excessive doses of RF radiation. Uh, there was one time when our DJ Rob Weisberg, portrayed here as a stoner, which he is not, um, came down to the radio station uh, with a band, the, uh, what were they called? They were called the Atmosphere Ensemble or something, um, the Atmosphere Crew. And since they couldn't broadcast from the studio because there was no power down at the studio, uh, they, just brought, they just drove up to the transmitter site and this band played from the parking lot of the Mount Fuji Steakhouse restaurant. Um, it was pretty apparent from those early days at WFMU for me in the mid 80s that Uppsala College, the owner, was probably uh, going to go under. They were in deep, deep distress. Uh, let me see if my next picture, no, that doesn't really relate to that, okay. Uh, the college was in very deep financial distress. I would go to staff meetings and they would talk about the teachers, the faculty would talk about not having paper, uh, not, have, not having uh, any kind of supplies, 
the college was going to um, borrow money against unpaid tuition at about 10 cents on the dollar uh, in order to keep going. Um, but it was in very, very deep financial distress. So we set up our first not-for-profit group. We set up a 501c3 organization called Friends of WFMU. Uh, and we did that with college permission to protect our fundraising money from the college, to prevent the college from being able to spend it on other things and to make us fight for the money that was donated uh, to us. Uh, that went pretty well for a while, but then a new president and a new financial officer came in at Uppsala College. And the first thing they did was they seized all the accounts of every department on campus that had any income at all. So for example, a lot of the athletic teams had admission fees, uh, the theater department had admission fees, et cetera. So anybody who had admission fees and any source of income had illicitly set up bank accounts and the first thing that the new president of the college did was seize all those bank accounts. But because we had actually done it with college permission and we had done it legally, they could not take our money. Um, so that was good for us, but it created an incredible amount of tension. Um, the college began to hate friends of WFMU as it was the one income generating department that they couldn't have access to the money from. Um, so I saw that happening uh, at the same time, I um, at the same time I set up a second 501c3 to try to look for other frequencies that WFMU might be able to use if Uppsala College did sell the license to a Christian broadcaster, which which they were looking at. Uh, they were they were looking at that uh, very aggressively, actually. Um, at around the same time, uh, we were attacked by uh, four different NPR stations in the New York area who were using an ancient geographic error to uh, try to get us to lower our power down to next to nothing. Um, so that was happening as Uppsala College was going down the tubes. They both became fairly big news stories in the New York area. Um, and uh, as, as that period went by, um, it, became, it became a very weird year for me when I was essentially wearing two hats for Uppsala College. I was wearing the hat of Friends of WFMU. That was the black hat. They hated me when I was the representative of WFMU, of Friends of WFMU, because it was the one, the one bank account they couldn't get their hands on. Um, and then I would also wear the hat of Oracle Communications, which was an almost identical 501c3. It had an overlapping board with Friends of WFMU. But the odd thing was when I met with the college as friends of WFMU, I was uh, the bad guy. <laughs> but when I met with them uh, wearing the hat of Oracle Communications, I was the good guy because I was trying to buy their radio station at that point. Uh, and uh, they were interested, but they never would sign the line. And they never would sign the contract. We had contracts drawn up. Um, and meanwhile, Uppsala College was beginning to go down the tubes uh, faster and faster. In the end, Uppsala College decided to sell WFMU's broadcast license to Oracle Communications, the second 501c3 that I set up. And the only reason they finally decided to sell it at the end was to make their final payroll. We found out later that the money they took from the proceeds of the sale of WFMU was used to achieve their final payroll. Um, I borrowed the money that I needed from WFMU, uh, that I needed to buy the license from a listener donor. And then several months after the FCC approved the purchase, uh, we had a fundraiser to pay that person back. Um, meanwhile, with all this bad news happening, this became a typical refrain um, among our community in the New York, New Jersey metro area. Um, these horrible things kept happening to us. Um, but on the other hand, I felt that we actually had been lucky uh, because the college declared the type of bankruptcy that is complete liquidation, uh, not the kind of bankruptcy that allows you to reorganize. Uh, so we were the only department at Uppsala College that actually survived. Uh, and we were left, we were left as the only occupied building on the 40-acre college campus. This is my dog Sammy who's joining me now. Um, as Embarrassing, I guess, or I don't know what you want to say about headlines like this and the kind of attention we were getting. Just as a quick aside, this wasn't the worst 
press we ever got. That goes to NPR, who in a tweet a couple of years ago described us as New Jersey's crappy, chaotic, and iconoclastic radio station. And they meant to say scrappy, but they tweeted crappy. And they refused to send out a corrected tweet. All I wanted was NPR to say that they meant scrappy, not crappy. That's all I was asking for, but they wouldn't even give me that. Um, fast forward to 2005 and Hurricane Katrina. Um, this was our first experience with Hurricane Radio. Um, we had been very, very close uh, for a number of decades with WWOZ due to a couple of personal friendships. Uh, and also the fact that WFMU and WWOZ in the early 90s were two of the community radio pioneers who really started broadcasting and taking the web very seriously. Um, so in August 2005, Hurricane Katrina uh, swamped New Orleans. Um, it took WWOZ off the air. Uh, it drove the WWOZ paid and volunteer staff all over the country. Um, this was their studio building with the roof, part of the roof tarped over because it had been torn off uh, and many inches of rain had poured inside and destroyed a lot of the in interior. They never went back to that studio. That was the studio at Louis Armstrong Park and they never went back there. Um, but when this happened and I'm, <clears throat> I was watching it as it was happening, um, I reached out to their general manager, David at the time um, and offered to at least get a stream up um, something resembling WWOZ, so they could try to keep their community of listeners together and their community of staff together. Uh, David gave me the go ahead. Um, so within a couple of days, we had a bank of uh, MP3s of New Orleans music. I think we had about five or 10,000 uh, music MP3s that we just started rolling on random and we got a stream up and it was called WWOZ in Exile. And immediately the uh, OZ staff and the OZ community of listeners started reaching out to me. Uh, and one thing that a lot of people were reaching out to me about is they had air checks of WWOZ. Um, so people started sending me digital files, digital files of their uh, archives and of air checks. And sometimes they would send me cassettes and we would digitize them. So within a couple of days, uh, just a jukebox of New Orleans MP3s was transforming into a recreation of WWZ's actual program schedule, which we were putting together with the help of the OZ uh, community of listeners and staff members. Um, that lasted a few months. Um, gradually, they took over the stream and they took over the website, and they and then they eventually finally got back on the air from new studios. Um, but when all was said and done, we had helped them uh, retain their audience, retain their staff cohesion, and we had raised $350,000 for them uh, through our website from their listeners being able to donate through our website uh, to uh, help with the, uh, the restoration of WWOZ. We were able to get a uh, FCC waiver, uh, which was granted nationwide actually to help uh, WWZ and some of the other radio stations in New Orleans that needed help. And actually, there were many dozens of community radio stations um, who helped out OZ in the wake of Katrina as well. Um, I do want to point out that in terms of streaming New Orleans MP3s, uh, we just did that. We did not ask for permission. We did not seek royalty licenses. We just did it and nobody ever raised a question or a fuss with us. I'm not saying that that was the right thing to do, but I don't think that it would have worked if we had, uh, if we had started trying to find licenses and permissions and had asked people for permission for what we were about to do. We simply got a 24 hour stream up, calling it WWOZ in exile, made up of about five to 10,000 New Orleans MP3s. And we did it without permission of anybody. It only lasted a couple of months, and we never got in trouble for that. Um, fast forward now to Hurricane Sandy, uh, which I believe was 2012, October 2012. Um, I was very lucky during Hurricane Sandy. I got flagged as inappropriate about three dozen times. Uh, this was me on the way to the radio station the morning after Hurricane Sandy. 
Uh, but this was as I was just starting out and the water quickly got too deep for me to make it there. I never did make it there by that route. I had to take another route on my bicycle and it took me all day uh, to get there. The night before Hurricane Sandy, uh, in retrospect, I stupidly decided we were going to try to stay on the air uh, throughout the hurricane, even though a more or less direct hit was forecast for our area. Um, in retrospect, I should have turned everything off and sent everybody home, but we stupidly tried to stay on. I found two hurricane volunteers, one of whom was from Florida, who relished the opportunity to try to keep the station on the air all night long. Um, but by 9 p.m. that night, uh, all the transmitters went off the air due to lack of electricity. Uh, and the station, the studio in Jersey City went off the air due to lack of electricity. Um, but amazingly, the website stayed up. Everything related to the website, which were all, all those files were located on servers in Virginia at Amazon. That all stayed up all night long. So the show that was on the air when we went off the air um, had a chat board open on our website. And you can see, you can see that this happened, the first comment here is at about 12.09 AM, nine minutes after midnight. We had already been off the air for three hours. But people, the people who were listening at the moment that we went off the air continued to stay on the station website chatting with each other. Um, I couldn't couldn't reach the station very easily. This this map shows to the left here the area in white, what was essentially an island. The Hudson River uh, flooded into Jersey City and Hoboken, and we were on the very very edge of this white island here. That's where we were located. Um, but the next morning, I woke up and I looked at the website and saw that not only was the website still up, but a lot of our listeners were still on it. And they were still commenting and talking and talking about how they could help WFMU. Could they donate money, et cetera, et cetera. I was due to be on the air at 9 a.m. that morning. Um, so I just logged on to the website and pretended I was on the air, even though I was not on the air. And I was just posting pictures of hurricanes and floods and pictures of silence. And I was pretending to play silent songs such as the John Cage four minute, 33 second remix. Um, and the amazing thing was people didn't care that I wasn't broadcasting. I think more people came to the website and participated in the chat on that playlist than on a typical morning, about, about twice as many. Um, and then this was, this was the discussion that people were having uh, about the silence. <laughs> Uh, people were making joke requests about um, other other silent songs, and they were again talking about um, whether they could donate money to help WFMU get back on the air uh, and, and help repair the damage. Um, so this is this was a real wake up call for me. This was sort of a realization that we were able to do radio, or in some way, the the style of radio, the style of community building that we had developed survived even taking away the audio, taking away the radio programming itself. So more people came on. Uh, they started pledging. Um, within two weeks, I think we had raised $150,000 uh, for repairs without even asking for it, without ever asking for it, just from the listeners talking amongst each other and deciding that FMU needed help. And they just went to the existing donate button on the website and donated um, a lot of money, at least half the money that we needed to get back on our feet. But this was the morning after, and by 12 o'clock noon that day, uh, we were able to sort of get back on the air from a home studio in Pittsburgh. This is not the home studio in Pittsburgh. This was another one of the home studios that we set up in Hoboken. So this is me and one of our DJs, Irwin, um, and Lisa down there. Um, and this was the studio that we threw together to broadcast directly from home uh, right to our servers in Virginia. So in fact, even by the next morning after the hurricane, even though all of our FM transmitters were off, uh, our community had held together on the website through chat. And sorry, I'm struggling with my dog here. And uh, we were able to get back on the web uh, within hours of the end of the hurricane. And this is typical of the uh, home studios that we had going in Pittsburgh. 
uh, Brooklyn, Hoboken, Jersey City. There's a Zoom mixer here. I don't know if people can see my cursor or not. I hope you can. Um, so this is a nice little Zoom digital mixer. And then we had one laptop for DJing through using programs like Tractor. Uh, and then we had another, another laptop for streaming directly to the server in Virginia using NiceCast. Over here is a little M-Box and buried amongst the cables somewhere, there's a couple of microphones and headphones. And that was it, that was the extent of the home studio and that's the way we broadcast uh, for a week. And we called it WFMU in exile. And during that week we raised 150 grand without even asking for it, just by staying on the air, just by keeping the website up and trying hard. And even though it was insane, um, it was really fun. I look back. I look back on the days after Hurricane Sandy very, very fondly, especially in relation to the current pandemic, because the hurricane and, and and it's probably very unlike the wildfires. Also, I've never lived through wildfires, but in the aftermath of the hurricane, uh, there was no electricity anywhere for around a week, and it really was the best form of anarchy I've ever seen. It was anarchy in the wonderful sense that it was just people helping one another people would hook up uh pe people would hook up charging stations to cars uh to bicycle chargers and there was just such a wonderful feeling of community and togetherness and everybody helping one another uh for the week or two after the hurricane while there was still no electricity um, and that, that is something that's been missing uh missing from the pandemic uh in the aftermath of the hurricane chris christie came to visit and I was fortunate enough to have a friend Photoshop me in to one of his hugs long before he contracted COVID. Um, so now we're, what we went through with Hurricane Sandy was very good training for the pandemic, uh, which is still where we're at now. Uh, we went into lockdown along with many, many other radio stations and many, many other institutions. We went down into lockdown in March. Uh, and we went to a skeleton crew, myself, and about eight other, uh, eight other people. And that was our little bubble. That was our pod. Nobody else was permitted into the radio station. And immediately we just started airing archived programming, basically reruns. We were just airing reruns. And it was awful. It was really awful. I had always thought that if, if push ever came to shove and we had a really all out emergency, we could always stay on the air just by airing reruns. Um, but that only lasted a couple of days because I found it so disturbing uh, to have a radio station that has been so live and spontaneous uh, airing programs that had aired from a year ago, which had dated references, giving out, giving out announcements about cultural events that obviously were canceled. So that didn't last long. And we quickly started getting people, again, piping themselves in from their home studios, live if they could, not live if they couldn't. And you can see this is me with the, uh, the uh, mask over my ear plates, the mask over the microphone. Um, I'm sure this is very familiar to all of you. And then in the background here, we have the little sign that we started, skeleton days. This was day number seven of the lockdown. I think we're now, it's 200 days later now. We're now, I think we're at about day, day 207 of the lockdown. Uh, the first thing that we started doing after that was we tried to get all of our DJs to get home studios together. Um, we were lucky to raise a little bit of money for that purpose. Um, two different listeners donated $7,000 so that we were able to buy microphones and uh, digital analog converters for most of our DJs. And we were able to put together about 50 home studios in the next couple of weeks. And that probably was the single most challenging thing um, that I've, uh, I've ever had to do at FMU was putting that, putting that many home studios together with no money or with very little money, uh, without being able to visit their home, without them being able to bring a laptop to the station. But fortunately, we had a lot of engineers helping us. And we were able to get almost everybody up and running uh, to do live radio uh, within about a week or two. And that's still where we're at now. Uh, we, went through, we went through the spring when New York and New Jersey were the epicenter of the pandemic. 
uh, and it was very sobering um, because there were so many people around from our community and even from the radio station who developed it. And I, we all knew many people who died. And uh, we also have known many people, including some of our own DJs, um, who got COVID, recovered, and are now dealing with what might be permanent after effects, one of whom, one of whom has very, very severe uh, neurological symptoms months, months after she uh, approved. So we're still taking it extremely seriously from the experience we had in the spring. Uh, we're still locked down. We have no plans of opening up until next June um, if we, if we uh, do that. Uh, one of the members of the skeleton crew painted this as a way of thanking the rest of the skeleton crew in the stairwell. Um, very few people <laughs> have seen it because we've had to lock out 200 of our volunteers from the building. Um, this just shows very, very simply uh, the best working setups that we had for home studios. I know that um, Art FM did a whole did a whole session on this, um, so I'm sure there's already been a great deal of discussion. Um, but we've been doing remotes over IP, you know, people broadcasting from home studios over the internet for a long time for probably about 20 years. Uh, but now it's gotten so much more complicated and in fact, so much more difficult than it used to be that that was a really big surprise to me. When we had to build 50 home studios, I thought, oh, that's not gonna be so hard until I realized that there's so many more options now than there were about 10 years ago. And in fact, so many more devices that people can use that it really made it much, much more complicated. So we have about, in total, we probably have about 100 home studios all over the world uh, from our DJs, and probably no two of them are alike. And that makes, that makes the whole thing very, very challenging, especially when we wanna move to the next step. And for example, we are trying to move everybody to the next step now so that they can have a, uh, a co-host or do a good sounding live interview from their home studio. So very few of them are able to do that, and that's the next challenge. Um, that we've that we've tried to take on uh, to get people working from their home studios. Uh, we still have uh, human, we still have human beings at the radio station, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Even though we probably don't need to, um, early on after the lockdown, we had a break in. Fortunately, the only thing that was stolen was a 10-year-old Mac. So we were lucky. I was actually happy to get rid of that Mac. And I was grateful that nobody got hurt. And uh, other than a door, nothing got broken. But it was our first ever break in. So after that, we decided we're not going to have any un unattended operation at all. And uh, even though we have people broadcasting <clears throat> from these home studios all over the world, uh, we still have a human being in the studio 24 hours a day. Uh, and I think it's also important because when, when this thing does finally lesson to the point that we can reoccupy the building. Uh, one of the challenges I think that I'm facing now is, uh, is that people, many people prefer broadcasting from home, of course. Why wouldn't they prefer broadcasting from home um, to getting onto a disgusting subway or two or three and schlepping everything out to WFMU, doing their show and then getting all the way back by mass transit. Uh, but to me, it's very, very important that a radio station actually have an internal living soul out of the studios and offices. So I'm really hoping that we can get back to that. But I am frankly worried that it's going to be a real challenge um, because in the past, prior to the lockdown, I think I only ever, I think out of the 168 hour broadcast week, I think I gave three hours permission to not broadcast live from the building. So only three hours out of 168 were pre-recorded coming from elsewhere. Um, now it's, it's over 90%. Um, and I think it's going to be, it is going to be a challenge to get back, to get back to people accepting that they have to come to the radio station to do their radio show. Uh, we had to cancel all of our live events. We used to do a lot of live events, uh, a big record fair that raised a ton of money. So that's a huge chunk of income that we've never seen before. Um, but we are starting to do Zoom fundraisers. This was a Zoom fundraiser we did last night, uh, which was a great success. And in fact, 
this is the second Zoom fundraiser that we did. We did we're doing one every Saturday night this month. And amazingly, we're finding that we're raising about twice as much money on Zoom with the same events than when we were doing them in our own ground floor venue. Um, so I think that we're going to be doing more and more Zoom events um, and, and then hopefully <laughs> bringing them back into our building, into our venue, Monty Hall, um, and hopefully not losing half of our revenue. Uh, the reason why we're doing so much better on the Zoom events is because there's no geographical barrier. Um, so uh, we can get a lot more people attending. And amazingly, people are willing to pay $10 uh, for tickets for something like this. Um, we're also in the midst of a, a quiet pledge drive right now. And it's our first pledge drive since we went into lockdown and we're doing amazingly well. I, I can't believe how easy it has been and how well we're doing um, in spite of everything that's happened. And I think it really speaks to the rapport that we developed with our listeners during the months of lockdown and the fact that we have been live so we've really been we've really been um there for them and that's the most common the most common phrase that we've received from our listeners is that uh, we've been there for them we've helped to keep them sane and uh that's exactly what we we're trying to do and now it's really paying off for us now we're doing our first fundraiser and uh, it's just going gangbusters. I, this is our quiet one too. We're not even begging more than once a show, um, maybe once every three hours, and we're still doing very well. Um, this is a photograph that I love from Tehran uh, after one of the horrible earthquakes that leveled Tehran, and it's a little Iranian girl holding her radio. And it just represents to me uh, that radio's greatest strength, I think, is in the wake these days, in the wake of disasters and catastrophes and crises, um, all of which we have in spades right now. So I think it's actually a really wonderful time uh, to be doing radio. And that ends my uh, prepared portion. And I'd be happy to talk about anything I've talked about or any, anything else, any other topics that anybody cares to bring up. And Mary, are you still on here with me? Uh, sure, I'm Ken. Okay. I guess I should unshare, which I leave my, there's my email address. Yeah, if you want to leave that up, that's fine. I leave my email address. I'm always happy to converse and help out other community radio people and stations. So please mark that down and reach out to me if there's anything I can do. Sure, we do have a, a question here. You guys can also unmute yourselves, that's fine. But um, Bennett asks, where did you find Clay Pigeon? He's an incredible artist and communicator. Is he still on the air? Um, yeah, Clay Pigeon is the guy, that's the air name of the person who does our morning show, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9 a.m. He's the only DJ who gets paid. And um, it's a show that we put on the air to really try to attract uh, a mass audience, a mass drive time audience. Um, and he came, he came from Florida. Um, he's born in Iowa. And then he spent a lot of time in the arts and music community of Tampa, Florida. And he was in a band. He was in a band that opened up for the cars on one tour. And then he became a telemarketer uh, working in Milwaukee. And that was when I met him. A we had a mutual friend who gave me a tape of one of his shows from the community station in Tampa, WMNF. And I heard that WMNF tape and I loved it. And I reached out to him and I offered him a show, even though he was in Milwaukee. And that was one of the three one hour shows that we had um, where he, he sent it in on cassette. Um, and then uh, he got so into the station and he became such a part of the fabric of the station, even from Milwaukee. He met a WFMU listener, they got married, he moved to New York. And then when it was time to uh, time to have tryouts for somebody to do our brand new morning show, it's three years old now. It's kind of brand new still by, by our standards. Um, he 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 tried out for the job and he got it. He really there was no no contest between him and everybody else. Uh, he's incredibly creative. Uh, really lives and breathes radio, and uh, it's really nice that we have this show. I, I call him, I sometimes call Clay Pigeon WFMU's ambassador to the normal people uh, because WFMU has done such a great job appealing to artists and weirdos and freaks and radicals, et cetera, et cetera. And now we have a morning show 
uh, that thanks to Clay Pigeon is actually appealing to like working class people, which is very new for us, which is really kind of exciting because a lot of them are also now finding out about the rest of the station. I'll try to be shorter in future answers. Oh, that's okay. Um, Jim has a question. Jim, did you want to unmute yourself? Hey, how you doing, Kenny? Hey, Jim. Uh, I just want I just want to know how Audience Engine is doing, man. Um, Audience Engine is doing fine. It's taking much, much longer than I ever ever imagined. Uh, I also had major personnel snafus. One of my main partners passed away. Uh, another one of them left the country, um, but it's still going and we're still using it and it's working very, very well. Um, I still don't think it's going to come to market for at least another year though. Um, but the project is still very much alive and the software is getting better and better. And I actually still don't see anything out there that's very similar to the software that we're developing. Um, what we're developing, by the way, um, is a platform for people to uh, engage with their audience to publish their playlists and create community based around chat around the playlist the way WFMU does uh, and then folding that into a fundraising system. So that's what Audience Engine is. Okay, thanks. Ruth had a question about the Zoom talent show and then we had a follow-up from Paul about the nonprofit. So I will go in that order. Yeah, the Zoom talent show um, I, I actually was inspired by KMUD uh, from Garberville, California. I, I was looking around for Zoom talent shows and I came across, I came across a video of a, of a listener talent show that KMUD did, um, which you can probably still find online on YouTube. And that inspired me to try to put together a live, uh, a live talent show, which we did last night. And uh, it went great. Uh, we had a plate spinner, we had about five bands. Uh, we had a bunch of comedians. We had a magician. And uh, we had a lot of audience participation stuff and contests. And uh, it was great. We had 100 people, paid 10 bucks a piece. So we made about $1,000. And uh, everybody had a really great time. And that's the second Saturday night Zoom session we've done now. We always try to do a lot of special programs and events in the month of October. Um, and uh, the one we had a week ago Saturday night also went great, uh, which was karaoke. Um, and I didn't think that karaoke over Zoom would work or be possible, but we really spent, we spent a lot of time working on it. And it actually worked pretty well. It worked, it worked very, very well. And we're gonna be doing that again as well. All right, Ruth, uh, you had a question. No, that was my question about the talent show. <laughs> I'm really curious about karaoke, though, over Zoom. <laughs> yeah, well, I got to say that we, we, we had an engineer. We actually had two engineers working on it. Um, so it's not, something, it's not something that we just found a great platform that worked. Um, and the two, the two engineers, you know, they worked on it for like a month until we figured out how to get it to work. Um, and then even then it wasn't perfect, but the, the areas where the, the, the places where it fell down were um, usually on the singer side. Sometimes we had people who had signed up to sing a song and then their microphone didn't work. <laughs> so that was a bit of a, that was, a, that happened a couple of times. And then last night during the Zoom, during the Zoom talent show last night, because half the acts were comedians, um, I definitely learned a big lesson about how to do stand up comedy over Zoom, um, because we weren't sure how do you do comedy over Zoom when you don't have a room full of people laughing. So we thought it was clever to ask the comedians whether they would prefer a, a fake laugh track or we just unmute everybody and then they have real laughter. And most of the comedians said, yeah, just unmute everybody. What we didn't realize is that when we have a talent show like this, you have groups of people watching, you have families watching, they're talking to one another. They're not sitting in silence the way they would in a theater. So when you unmute everybody, you just, all of a sudden you get five conversations. So now I finally figured out how to do comedy over Zoom, which would be to um, have a little bit of fake laughter, but then have maybe 20 or so designated laughers. <laughs> and every time a comedian <laughs> comes on, we would unmute 
a particular 20 people who know that they are not to have a conversation, that they are only unmuting themselves so that they can laugh. <laughs> All right. Sorry. I apologize. That was Paul that actually had the question about the nonprofit. Paul, would you? Yeah, like great. That? Yeah. Um, I'm from KZFR in Chico, California, not a big urban area like you, but um, I'm interested in knowing in the decision making processes with all of this, what the relationship of you uh, to the board and, and what kind of involvement the board of your nonprofit has in making fundraising decisions and broadcasting decisions? Um, well, currently uh, the board is um, 11 people and I report to them. They are my boss. The board is my boss, but the board is collectively my boss. There's no single person on the board who I answer to. I answer to the board as a collective. Uh, the board does not get involved in broadcasting or programming issues, um, but they are very, very involved in the finances and the stewardship of the money. Uh, and that's probably the biggest role they've played. Um, in the last four years has been steering us back uh, to fiscal um, health um, because we really went through a lot. We went through a lot of terrible times uh, in the last five years that took us to the brink of bankruptcy. Um, so that has been their strength, I think, has been um, uh, helping, helping plan financially and analyze financially and manage debt and manage per kind manage helps to listen to Doodle, right? Manage major purchases. It really helps my that. concentration. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I find that the same exactly. Hey, we ask um, everybody to mute minutes. your mics unless you're speaking. Thank you so much. Um, we have questions from Ethan A.D. and followed by C.J. All right, Ethan. Okay, well, let's go on to C.J. and maybe Ethan will pop back in. C.J., would you like to unmute yourself? I just did. Hey, Ken. All right. Clay, Clay Leander out on the out skirts of the Bay Area here. Hey, Clay. Um, and uh, just good to see you again. You too. I, uh, I, I <clears throat> as somebody who's been here a, a long time in this biz, um, we saw the recent, uh, we all experienced a recent passing of um, uh, Lorenzo Milam. And one thing that's, um, makes that that's uh, caused me to give thought more thought to is passing the torch and i'm just um interested in your own thoughts of observations what kind of contingencies or plans have you made there there's a phenomenon in the nonprofit world some of us know as founderitis uh where it really uh, you know somebody who's a really foundational um spirit in guiding the launch of a station and think of nonprofit organizations having a mission. I always contended that the true test of the viability of the mission is when it's uh, founders or leadership step out of the way and uh, the remaining uh, board and staff are able to perpetuate that. And uh, I'm just kind of interested in your feedback and thoughts and observations on these things. Oh yeah, I think it's super important to have succession plans and to be having succession discussions at the board level. Um, I, I do think that's sort of something, that, a really important thing for the board to be thinking about. And my board does think about it. Um, and the succession plan does not remain static uh, because the composition of our full-time staff changes. So in the past, I had an assistant general manager who was up to taking over my position. And at that time, uh, the succession plan was that she would take over the general manager's position. Um, currently, the assistant general manager has a completely different skill set. Uh, and while um, they're excellent in fundraising, they're very weak technically. So we don't think that the current assistant general manager could step into my shoes. So the board has asked me to implement another, a different succession plan whereby at least temporarily every department would fall into the hands of one of the other existing full-time staff 
Um, and then another part of our succession plan also is that we have a key man life insurance policy on my life. So there's a bounty on my head um, so that if I do disappear or die suddenly, the station will get a windfall of $2 million, um, which will help them you know, deal, deal with um, segueing into a new, you know, a new way of operating. But right now, the succession plan is to have each one of my various jurisdictions go to a different member of the full-time staff. They know that, it's been discussed, uh, and then a search begins for a, re for a replacement. Um, and we would, have money from, we would have money from an insurance policy to help with that. All right, uh, Stephanie Schubert. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, hi. Hi, Hello. this is Ursula. Thank hi, you. Ursula. Hi, thank you for your presentation. And um, I just, I wanted to follow up on the uh, talent show just a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, did, the, did, the, did the money come from people buying tickets to be on the Zoom call or was, the, it, was it open to the public and then people would donate? No, it was ticketed. Um, so, yeah, it was people buying tickets in order to attend. Mm -hmm. And and was it was there a criteria for where you got the talent, or did you just kind of wing that in terms of who who they would be? Um, no, I solicited talent on the air on um, one of my shows, the show that sponsored it, uh, which is like a comedy show. So I I solicited um, for act there as well as on the newsletter for the, e the email newsletter for that show and i but i checked everybody out i definitely mm -hmm. i didn't want i did not want it to be an open mic um i've i've put in i've put in a couple of years on the open mic circuit myself um as a stand-up so i know <laughs> i know how bad open mics can be um so yeah <laughs> it, so it was curated but i would say that i accepted 75 percent of the people who were interested in performing mm -hmm. And um, I'm assuming they all donated their time and talent. Yeah, and then we also had a prize. We had a prize for the winning performer. Oh, okay. Uh, a money prize or a gift prize? Yeah, a money prize, $150. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. That's a, it's really inspiring. And, uh, uh, you know, it's just really great to hear things are, are good at WFMU. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, the Zoom, the Zoom events, I real, honestly, you know, I, I am not a fan of Zoom. <laughs> And I've spent, mm -hmm. like all of you, I've, we've, I've been spending hours in Zoom. And then when we thought of having, you know, Zoom fundraisers, I was not optimistic, <laughs> um, either technically or financially or in any way. But I'm, I'm just blown away by how well the last, the first two that we've done, I'm amazed how well they went. Okay, thank you. That's really great to hear. Thanks. So next up, we have Dave and then Kenya. They both have some questions for you. Dave, are you able to unmute yourself? Oh, Dave says he doesn't have a mic. Oh, okay, Dave, I'll read it out then, uh, hang on. He wanted to know how many paid staff do you have versus volunteers? How do you recruit volunteers other than the actual programmers? Um, we have um, six full-time people, about four part-time people and 200 volunteers. And um, we recruit different volunteers in different ways. Um, I, I guess there's the, the way we recruit on-air volunteers, like air staff and air talent. That comes from the existing air talent. Um, right now we have a new program called Radio Row, which is just a renamed version of an old program we used to have called the Listener Hour. So we have a one hour, a one hour show in prime time for a different DJ every week. Um, and so we, we're finding a lot of good people that way. Uh, and in fact, we're using that program to really try to diversify the station, um, which is much needed. Um, so we're using Radio Row to try to get um, more women and people of color involved in the station, and that's going very well. And then, and then the way we get volunteers, uh, the way we get volunteers on um, off-air positions is one of my full-time positions is somebody who's a combination volunteer director and studio broadcast engineer. Um, and he maintains email communication 
with all the off-air volunteers and his job has all but disappeared. Um, it's, you know, he, he's doing a lot more engineering now than he was because we no longer have any volunteers coming to the station. But when we did, he was the one who organized um, all the uh, t-shirt packing, you know, solicitation packing, postcard mailings, um, as well as a zillion other things. So he now does, he, he still does manage the relatively smaller number of volunteers who are still performing volunteer duties off site, like news writing, um, some audio production, some audio editing. Um, but the number of volunteers who are involved now has plummeted um, since we're not allowing them inside the building. All right, thank you. Uh, Kenya, you have a question. Can you unmute yourself? Great. Okay. Hi, Sammy. Um, when you were talking about clay, or when you were talking about clay, I was wondering about how that kind of evolved. If I remember correctly, you had a schedule shift after a long time that opened up a morning slot, and you thought pretty seriously about capturing a drive time audience. And I was wondering if that was kind of relevant to anyone here, like if that grew your audience, if it's still working after COVID, if it's something you recommend other stations considering? Yeah, it, it, it's gone very, very well, but it's still been, it's still been too early to tell. And in fact, um, the last fundraiser we had in March, which would have been the third, it would have been on the, the, the two, that would have been the fundraiser, the big fundraiser that Clay Pigeon would have done on the two year anniversary. So we were really looking to last March's fundraiser for data, uh, how many people, how many different people were pledging. Um, in fact, that's the much most, that's the most important metric to me is not how much money he was raising, but how many different individuals were pledging. And the first two years, the first two fundraisers, one when he was brand new and one when the show was a year old, they were good, but they were what you would expect from a brand new show or a one year old show. And we were really hoping last March that we would see nice numbers in terms of uh, audience donors, you know, in terms of the number of donors. Uh, we were hoping that we would see that. But unfortunately, from the time we started our fundraiser last February 29th, but we started it on February 29th. And by a week later, the bottom had dropped out and people were frantically buying toilet paper and hand sanitizer. And our audience just fell off a cliff because that was the, uh, you know, that was the prepper phase of the pandemic was, you know, the first and second week of March. So that, that had a huge negative effect on Clay Pigeon last March, also because schools were closing left and right in New York and New Jersey during the first two weeks of March. So that real, his, his drive time audience got much, much smaller. So that completely threw us off. So I guess we really don't know. <laughs> well, I can tell you is that the, the program was growing great, but then, you know, we, we, we didn't get the numbers that we were expecting to see whether, whether we had plateaued um, or whether we were still seeing the nice growth that we had been seeing. Um, he's, do, he's doing great right now. We're, we are doing a quiet fundraiser right now, and he's doing phenomenally well. Well, and really nice to hear relevant content in the morning. We just listened to his Eddie Van Halen tribute from Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> Ted Coe was asking a question about if you're still doing um, fundraiser gift fulfillment. So maybe I'll just tack that on and then mute myself. And um, Yeah, I, I guess Ted is asking about audience engine, which I'm still working on. It's still very much a going concern, just taking, yeah. free, taking freaking forever. Um, I, but actually, in yeah. terms of that does handle, that does handle gift fulfillment. I'm not sure if that's what he messed up. Are you still, are you still, uh, have you stripped it down at all? You said that the fun drive was really going well. So have you guys, are you still offering like the same number of gifts for each show and that sort of thing? Cause it's harder to do remotely. So I was just wondering that. Yeah. Well, we haven't done a big fundraiser remotely. Um, like I said, last March we were, we were doing it in person and we somehow stumbled to the finish line. Um, but the whole bottom was dropping out as we were doing our fundraiser last year, and we fell about 10% short. Um, then during the lockdown, once the lockdown really got going, we saw our online audience grow by 30%. Now we're doing a fundraiser and it's going really well, but, th but in terms of fulfillment, this is the really easy fundraiser. Uh, we, we give away a fraction of the stuff in March 
in, in, in October, sorry, we give away a fraction of the uh, stuff in, in October that we do in March. So we haven't done, we haven't done the March one yet and we're just actually beginning to really plan out March. Um, we probably won't give out as much as we normally do, but we're always trying to cut it down. We, we, we do actually try to cut down the amount of stuff we give a little bit every year. We definitely give out too much stuff. Uh, we've, been, we've been offering donors a way to opt out of getting any stuff. And thankfully, a lot of them take us up on that. Um, but yeah, the, the fundraiser in March is gonna be very weird. I don't know. Some people are gonna have co-hosts. Some people are not gonna have co-hosts. Uh, we're trying to prepare now, but yeah, I'm kind of worried about the March fundraiser. Um, Jim has a question for you. Well, hello, Ken. Greetings from the dead music capital of the world. Hey, Jim. <laughs> uh, glad to see you're still around and doing so very well. Uh, I, 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 sorry, I cannot help but uh, make a slight mention of the, the founder-itis, the founder syndrome that, you know, our type of media uh, still has. I, of course, uh, it was terribly infected with it. And uh, after 11 long years of work and heartache and fighting off the University of Texas and modifying the Wolfman Jack Treaty, uh, finally got co-op on the air, uh, halftime station forced to share the frequency with the University of Texas, only to have my sorry ass thrown off the air. Now, 25 years later, the Statesman, the local newspaper did a big uh, story about the states, uh, the history of the station. Uh, and the first half of the story was all about my work. And then the reporter asked me, said, well, so what happened after that? And I said, golly, I don't know. Uh, so uh, not to get all Lorenzo here, of course, I was a part of that uh, fine uh, memorial. Um, those of you who are still putting stations on the air and those of you uh, um, who are lucky enough to have founders, I know Ursula is here and, and, and many others, uh, Paul, uh, who put stations on the air, uh, this problem of uh, lynching uh, founders is something that still remains among our ranks. That's me on the soapbox. Yep, uh, Lorenzo wrote a whole <laughs> Lorenzo wrote a whole book about that issue. Yep. yep. What was the name of that book? The one about KTAL, was it? Uh, well, uh, there was the radio papers. There was the Crab Nebula. There was uh, Sex and Broadcasting, of course. There was the Merkin yeah. papers. Uh, maybe, maybe it was an essay or two in, in the radio papers. I don't remember. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a problem that, uh, I mean, you're talking about an issue that goes back to the French Revolution. So I don't know. What That's correct. And, it, and, it's not what unique, here? <laughs> and it's not unique to radio. We right. all know of other groups uh, where somebody puts their heart and soul and checkbook into an event uh, only to be thrown out. Uh, that, that's absolutely true. So it puts me, the last thing I'll say, sort of in the awkward position where I still consider myself a radio person. I'm covering, covering demonstrations, putting it on social media. Um, we're helping out groups that are getting on the air or going back on the air. I've traveled to more than 60 countries around the world, putting stations on the air and, you know, places like Haiti after the earthquake and Houston and New Orleans after Katrina. And I still have that radio bug, but people go, so where's Austin Airwaves? Can I tune into Austin Airwaves? I say, well, no, you can't. Put them. <laughs> right. We have questions next. from Peter, and then next after that, uh, Ethan Ad is back, so we'll we'll get him back in the rotation. Peter. All right. Well, um, I will. Uh, can, can you explain the DMC waivers that you mentioned at the beginning and what is or was at stake if you did not get those waivers? I'm sorry, which waivers? The DMCA, the uh, Digital Millennium Copyright oh, Act. Oh, oh, the DMCA waivers? Yeah. Yeah, hang on one second. I want to get my dog out of the room. I'll be right back. <sighs> Many of you have probably seen my cat pop up on the Sorry. Again. Yeah, so in, uh, in 2004, 2005, uh, when what was going on at that time were called the CARP hearings, C-A-R-P, Copyright Arbitration Royalty Panel, and uh, the new digital streaming industry and the music industry were coming up with um, rules regarding royalties for webcasters to pay if they broadcast copyrighted music over the web, as we did. 
And uh, I got very worried at that point that we wouldn't be able to afford the royalties that they were talking about for non-commercial broadcasting. That fear never came to pass. Um, I think it's quite manageable now. Um, but for a number of years there, we were very scared that we wouldn't be able to afford to continue webcasting. So we solicited um, about 2000 record labels and musicians to sign a waiver saying that they, they were allowing WFMU to not abide by the rules of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and to not have to pay royalties as well. Um, we, once, the, once the reasonable royalty rates got settled, we started paying them, even though we have these waivers. Um, and we did another mailing a few years after that. We did another mailing of several thousand uh, to, get, to get many more waivers. Uh, but the, the thing that those waivers lower our risk to is breaking some of the rules of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. So we have a great deal of permissions from record labels and musicians, for example, who are saying that, yes, we can archive their music on our radio archives for longer than two weeks. Uh, they're saying things like, yes, we can play three songs in a row by the same artist if it's on their record label, that kind of thing. Now, obviously, we don't have waivers from each and every record label in the world, and we do grant our DJs the freedom to play whatever they want, but complaints about such things are not generated en masse. They're generated by individual companies or individuals, meaning somebody has to level a complaint. So the fact that we have a good deal of a good deal of these waivers just lowers our risk to the point that I feel comfortable um, doing what we're doing with regard to the uh, DMCA, what are called, I think, what, what are they called? The complementary rules, which are the, like the rules that say that you can't play this many tracks from a certain, from a certain box set. Great information, thank you. Um, Ethan A.D., are you able to unmute yourself? You had a couple great questions. Okay, <laughs> well, um, I will just go ahead and then we'll go with the next. Uh, uh, let's see, Paul, I think you're up next, or Jim. Sorry, Jim, did you have a question? You were just making a comment, Paul? No, no, I didn't have another question. Okay. Does anyone other, Kenya wants to know if you locked uh, Sammy in the closet? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> locked, locked him out of the bedroom. Cool. Lewis uh, would like to know if you'd share a waiver. Uh, did you have any other questions, Lewis? Um, yeah, I would share the waiver. I have. I have several different versions of that waiver. Some are for just webcasting, um, some are for podcasting. Um, but yeah, I, I would happily share that waiver. Thank you. It, does anybody else have a question? Feel free to unmute yourselves uh, and, and go ahead and ask. And I guess if not, we will, um, well, I thank you so much for all the great information and uh, really just a lot to take in. So I know a lot of people have questions um, and they can reach you again. Can you flash your email again for us? Is yeah. There we go. There we go. You can reach Ken at WFMU.org. And uh, looks like I'm going to get Sharon here, and we will have some closing remarks from the conference. Let me uh, ask you to unmute and put Hi. you on the mic. Ken, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Sharon. Great job with the conference. Thanks. Uh, I think the first time we met was at the uh, CMJ conference in New York City years ago, trying to save college radio. Yeah. <laughs> So I just want to thank you for your commitment to community and college radio. You know, throughout the years I've known you and the years before that, uh, you've always been on the front lines there, um, came to the assistance of my college radio station, WR WRVU, rest in peace. But, uh, but you really took time out of your schedule and your activities with WFMU to reach out to us at WRVU to try to save our frequency. I know you did the same with KUSF and probably uh, KTRU and probably countless other stations across the country. So 
I really just want to recognize and thank you uh, for reaching out and for helping the younger um, stations and the stations that are in trouble, trying to help keep us on the airwaves. So thank you. Oh, thank you, Sharon. And uh, keep up the great work. You're doing such amazing work there. Great. Thank you, Ken. That's, that's an honor to hear from you. For real. So you, you've really been a hero to, to, I think, all of us here in the, the community radio world, um, seeing you save this frequency from near silence and turning it into uh, just a beacon for free speech and um, all kinds of craziness. So <laughs> we really thank you for that and just keeping the airwaves open to experimentation and pushing the boundaries of this medium in all kinds of wonderful ways. And now stepping in even to the Zoom world and seeing what we can do with that. So um, yeah, thanks, Sharon. Yeah, definitely. So thanks for being here. We all really appreciate it. Um, as you guys know, we're broadcasting this live on WXOX 97.1 FM. So if you do happen to unmute at any point, should have probably made this announcement earlier, but make sure you keep it FCC friendly. Um, this has been a wonderful conference. I have had such an amazing time. I have been brought to tears, I think, in pretty much all of the sessions, <laughs> you know, even the technical sessions, you know, where I'm just seeing, you know, these people that are so passionate about what they're doing and so giving with their knowledge and information, it's really been incredible. And the subjects that uh, we've talked about on this conference have been so powerful and so interesting. The speakers have brought so much knowledge. Um, you know, people have just really brought their hearts, their minds, their inspiration, everything except their bodies. You know, we're all here in every single way except physically. And we certainly miss that component of the grassroots radio conference. That's, um, you know, seeing each other in person and having fun and going for drinks after the conferences and all that kind of stuff is, uh, is sometimes more valuable than the sessions themselves, making those connections and those friendships that can carry us throughout the year and, um, you know, provide us with guidance and support. So this group of individuals gathered here, so many names here are true idols of mine. I came to the grassroots radio conference as a naive young person that thought I could save a college radio station from NPR takeover <laughs> and uh, came to the first grassroots radio conference of my life in Kansas City. And I heard about the conference. And I heard there was going to be this great gathering of community radio minds. And I just knew that someone there was going to have the answer. They were going to have the right lawyer or the right FCC rule or whatever it was to keep this college radio station WRVU on the airwaves. And I came to this conference with my suitcase and I showed up and, and set my suitcase down to the doors and I said, please help me save the station. And, and it was like, they, you could hear a pencil drop in the room and I believe it was Jim Ellinger said, forget that station. You're never gonna save that station. <laughs> he said, it's a done deal. If they're telling the world about it now, the, all the paperwork has already been taken care of and you'll never save it. But I didn't believe him. I definitely didn't believe him. And I continued to get all the great advice I possibly could from the conference that I could take back uh, to our little nonprofit that we had started in Nashville, Tennessee, um, to try to save the station. We went to the administration. We said, if you don't want it anymore, we've developed this nonprofit and we will be glad to take it off your hands. Um, what do you need? And we even offered to match the price that the public radio station was gonna pay for the frequency. We had some great, amazing uh, donors that were willing to help out. Um, and we really felt like we could do it and we could save the station and save this frequency for the students of Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but Jim Ellinger ended up being right. <laughs> and unfortunately we did, we, we did lose our frequency. Um, this beautiful radio station that had been on the airways for over 60 years, run by students only, um, all of a sudden was taken off the airways in what once was a, a bastion of true free speech, amazing music. So many great bands got their start in Music City because of this uh, radio station. And suddenly, no, it wasn't just silence. Now it was this classical music, very much like Clockwork Orange or something. You were just hearing this very sort of routine uh, classical music and, and all the voices were gone and all the creativity was gone and and it was you know a really it was a really terrible moment and it really made you realize how silent the city had become when those voices weren't there anymore uh, where there wasn't a frequency for people just to speak their minds to talk about whatever it was you know could it be silly things it could be bands it could be you know whatever but 
it was people talking about what was important to them. And that's what you don't hear on commercial radio. And you don't even hear it on public radio. The place you hear it is in community radio and college radio. You hear people being themselves and talking from their heart and sharing about the things that are really important to them. And bringing their friends on the airwaves or their kids, sometimes even their animals, you know, and you're hearing all this amazing stuff happening. Crazy, wild, just spur of the moment, you never know what you're gonna expect kind of things are happening on frequencies all across the country. But we lack a real network of coming together and we don't realize that we're out there for one another and that we are, we feel like, you know, we're kind of alone and there's no other radio station like us in town. And we feel kind of alone and, and we want to reach out and we want to have connections with other people who have been through these things before. And this is where the grassroots radio conference comes in. And this is why we knew we had to host this conference this year, despite all the national emergencies, the pandemic and all the things telling us that we shouldn't meet and we couldn't be together. We never once doubted that we were going to host this conference. Uh, we signed up for it in 2020. And for some reason, the world gave us this bizarre situation that we just had to handle. And I've just got to say that my team, our team, the WXOX family is beyond words, amazing, incredible. They have handled this conference so well, like complete professionals. I mean, it's been luxury for me because they've been just so professional and handling everything you know, so well. When I, when I started, the, I guess the couple days before this conference, I thought to myself, I just can't wait until this is all over. <laughs> no offense, but I was just ready. It was so much work, you know, packed into a little bit of time and I was just ready for it to be done. But the moment it started, I just wanted it to last forever. You guys were so amazing. The team that ran this was so amazing. The speakers were knocking my socks off, like I said, bringing me to tears at every moment. And it was just more unbelievable than, than we ever imagined. So many friends showed up. Some of you guys, I didn't know if you were gonna come and then you showed up at the last second. So I really love seeing your faces. It's been so neat to see inside your worlds, um, to see some of your studios and to see a little bit of your personality and some of your families. Um, it's really interesting in this new virtual situation we're kind of getting to know each other and ourselves in, in totally different ways. You know, it's really, I'm still very awkward with Zoom and all this, but I'm, I'm getting more custom and this crash course this weekend has really helped with that. So I just want to take a moment and recognize a few of the people that have made this thing totally amazing. And if you guys are here and feel like unmuting your mics and, and giving a little shout out or whatever, you know, I think everyone is so thankful. I've received so many compliments. Um, about how smoothly the whole thing is run. And, and let me tell you, we did not know what we were doing. We have never done anything like this before. And we didn't know how it was gonna go. And at the beginning of the week, we were still debating whether we were gonna use this platform or whatever. <laughs> so um, the fact that everything, now I can say that, it, that we're reaching the final moments, the fact that everything went so smoothly and went so well has everything to do with this very amazing team. And um, I would like to, first of all, thank Mary Yates, the conference coordinator. She is a true superhero. She's been totally amazing. I know many of you have had interactions with her. Mary, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's been fantastic and it's been a pleasure to help make this happen. And a great team. team. Thanks to all my teammates. I, I would have gone crazy if it weren't for you. <laughs> They're amazing and they will drive you crazy, but they are amazing. We got a great team. I mean, just so cool. And uh, Mary, uh, Mary has done everything from get the schedule together, uh, to, to scheduling the Zoom meetings, to communicating with speakers, to handling your tech calls uh, during the conference. I honestly don't know how she does it. She's a total wonder. Thank you so much. Um, Alan White has been our technical director. He's been helping Mary a lot with the uh, setting up the Zoom meetings and managing the Zoom meetings. Um, it was super exciting to have him on the team. Uh, I think he might have just gotten worn out. Alan, are you able to make, I don't know if he was able to make it tonight. No, he is, uh, he, he's taking a little time off, which I totally get. So Alan White, DJ Mythos, thank you so much. You've been incredible too. Um, and they've all been very patient with me because I'm a 
total boomer with all this stuff. I don't, I don't have any idea how to do any of this. In fact, I learned how to use Discord while we were here, which has been super fun. And I would definitely recommend you do that because uh, something that's so important is for us to stay in contact as we leave here. This can't be the end. This has to be the beginning of a new way for us to stay in touch and communicate. So one way that I've learned is, is through Discord. We've got a grassroots radio conference channel. Mary, can you pop on real quick and remind people how to connect with that? Sure thing, I'll post a link in the chat. Cool, great. And then we will, um, we will also continue our, on our website and provide information about things that are coming up and things that are happening. Um, obviously, we would love to have the conference in person as soon as possible. We hope we've given you a nice taste of Louisville and kind of all the craziness happening here, uh, both good and bad and always exciting and revolutionary. Um, and we, we hope that you guys can all be here with us and we can take you out to our favorite clubs and introduce you to our, our favorite bands uh, when you finally come here together. Um, and we hope that that's very soon. Obviously, we all do. Um, I'd also like to say thanks to Kate Gaglio Ng. She has been our amazing speaker coordinator. You might have emailed uh, or talked with her if you're a speaker or if you've had any GRC issues to deal with. Hi, thank you so much for attending. It's been amazing. Sorry, I'm, I'm actually on my DJ partner's phone because my phone died. Um, but you guys have all been incredible and this has been an amazing weekend. I couldn't have asked for anything better. We couldn't have asked for anybody better to help us out, Kate, for real. You've been amazing. You've been such a pleasure to work with, you know, just taking care of things so good. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Always on the ball. All right, Jackson Lee Swain. I'm not sure if Jackson's on the line. Jackson is our rock and roller in town. He helped Kate communicate with the speakers and get that all situated. He also curated our amazing silent disco last night that I hope many of you got to enjoy. That was such craziness and I personally really needed to get my dance on. So that was a lot of fun. So thank you, Jackson. For Thank you, everyone. It was a great meeting, everybody. Thank you so much. This was cooler than I really ever dreamed. I think he's speaking for all of us when he says that. Um, I, I really don't think any of us imagined that this would turn out to be such a moving, amazing experience. And learning so much, I don't know about you, but my mind has just totally expanded. Every single session, I'm like, you know, really having to take a lot of time to process and there's, there's going to be a lot of reflection on what I learned here and I know it's a lot. Um, also want to thank our DJs who spun at that silent disco last night. We've got Trevor Lamont, who was out there earlier, Anais Spin, and the gang at Wayfair Away. You guys were killing it, brought the visuals and everything. It was so much fun. And Wild Bill. Oh, and Wild Bill. Wild Bill, thank you. I kind of just threw him in with the uh, Wayfair Away gang there. They were mixing it up so good. It was awesome. Um, Tia Marie. Tia, of course, you guys, I know you guys have met and fallen in love with Tia over the weekend. Make sure you catch her show. She's going to be on Tuesday at 2 p.m. All these folks are DJs, so you got to catch them on the airwaves. Um, you know, we have, if you've enjoyed meeting them here, you'll enjoy, enjoy hearing their music. So we definitely hope you'll tune in to us uh, through our free WXOX app or through artxfm.com. I'm not trying to, to pitch anything here except my incredible staff, the incredible DJs of Art FM. They are so talented and creative and their shows just knock my socks off all the time. Um, let's see, I'd also like to say thanks to Margie Esrock. She's our sponsorship director. She was a whiz at that stuff, uh, which I'm terrible at. Um, so I thank Margie so much and always a wonderful person to work, work with. Uh, Jeff Jobson, Jeff helped, uh, in fact, curated all by himself the first night of music, the live music that we had from Art Sanctuary. He curates the Late for Dinner every Friday uh, at Art Sanctuary. They have a wonderfully huge indoor space where bands can spread out and, um, and play their music live on the internet for folks to enjoy. So that was lovely. Uh, we had Dane Waters, Cuvebo, um, Buddy Crime, and our very own Romel with two L's playing that night. And they were all amazing. And I know they all really enjoyed uh, playing their live music for you. And then let's see, um, definitely big shout out to Emily Miles. She has been <laughs> such a joy to work with and really picked up the ball uh, a couple times when we were in trouble over the weekend. So she's a lifesaver. 
and just a wonderful person to be around. She helped with our press releases and some of our graphic design and just did a, mar a marvelous job. And that stuff can be hard to do um, when you're trying to coordinate an entire conference. So Emily, thank you so much. And Chris Walls, uh, information specialist. He hooked us up with all the wonderfully easy forms that you use to register and all that kind of stuff. He helps uh, keep our world very organized like that. And then shout out to Kara Richardson. She also helped with our graphic design and did some beautiful stuff for us like she always does. Um, and then, you know, the thing I can't stand about uh, thank yous is that I always end up forgetting someone, but there were so many people that came to our meetings as we were preparing for this. So many people who uh, helped behind the scenes, tons of people volunteered to be speakers and Zoom hosts and, you know, even just to do an online conference, it takes a lot of people. So we, we thank everybody so much. Amazing RFM team. Thank you all for being here. I hope you learned a lot. I think you probably did. Um, and I want to thank our sponsors, obviously. And what I want to say about the sponsors is that I know and we know each of these businesses and these organizations personally, and that's what feels really good. It's people that we know and care about, that we know really care about the community radio world. Um, so we're super proud to have the support of the Pacifica Foundation. Um, Ursula, as you all know, is a powerhouse and community radio pulling us all together promoting our shows helping us get content when we need it um, just really keeping all the radio stations across the country together so Ursula thank you so much and thank you for bringing Chuck D to the conference <laughs> unbelievable really unbelievable we um, when Ursula first mentioned we, we have these uh, weekly Pacifica station manager meetings which have been a lifesaver during this time and we kind of every week there's usually a subject and then we can kind of vent and talk about what's going on in our worlds and um we were talking about the conference and then ursula just kind of really casually was like well chuck d does a show for pacifica maybe we could see if he'd do it <laughs> and it was like of course you know yes yeah, so please can we and um and she worked and worked and worked and worked on it and you know he's releasing his album right now and, and all this kind of thing super busy schedule and um they kept they kept saying maybe maybe we're gonna try we're gonna try and we uh, didn't know if it was gonna happen and, and i think we found out maybe about a week before the conference uh that yes chuck d in fact was gonna be here speaking to us and that was super exciting as you can imagine and it almost seemed like you know um it didn't even seem real and and so just one of those moments where you're just going wow this is really happening. We really got this amazing conference. Of course, by then we already had amazing keynotes. Uh, the great Ken Friedman. We had Will, Oldman, Will Oldham. Um, we had John Langford. We had Romel with two L's. Uh, we had Jessica, Jessica Linker. So we already had some amazing speakers. And then this just was absolutely kicking it over the top. So it was very exciting to have Chuck D. I want to shout out to Chuck D that when we were trying to save WRBU the, uh, down in Nashville, um, he showed up at one of our events and spoke about the importance of college and community radio. And so he is really living it too. And he's out there supporting and helping free voices on the American airwaves. So big shout out to Chuck D and thank him, you know, thanks to him for taking time to work with us. Um, we also had um, support from SCMS Inc, Broadcast Equipment Supplies. Jim Peck is your guy to talk to. He's been at the Grassroots Radio Conferences for a number of years and he will help you out with all your broadcast equipment needs. Um, Spinatron, Ava and Tom were at the conference. It was great to see them. They're always super helpful and supportive of community radio. Um, broadcast Tool and Die, David Klon, also a regular at the Grassroots Radio Conference, full of all kinds of technical knowledge and supplies and software. So talk to David for your technical needs. Mad Pixel Art and Design um, designed our fabulous logo, which you can actually get a t-shirt of. Uh, grassroots, well, it's virtualgrc.org slash t-shirt. If you want to go ahead and get your order in, we're going to get those out as soon as this is over. Um, but this logo turned out so fantastic. Um, Ron of Mad Pixel does a lot of great um, music posters around town and, and for national acts. And we were really honored to have him work on our logo for us. And just as a coincidence, Ron is related to our dear Mary who ran this conference there. They're I say, I do some of those around. designs, Sharon. <laughs> What's that? I was gonna say I do some of those designs, Sharon. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so 
sorry, Ron and Mary do them together. I guess I was saying Ron because he uh, did this particular one. Yeah. Mad Pixel is a great outfit. Mary is a wonderful photographer as well. And so they're incorporating a lot of her photography into their work. So check out Mad Pixel Art and Design. I'm sure they'll be glad to work with you uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, and the law offices of Michael Richards. So thank you so much for your support. We're super grateful to have all this support of these amazing people. Community radio is so important and I don't have to tell you, and um, we really need to invest in one another. Thank you again to the RFM Board of Directors, the rest of my staff. I wanna say thank you to Rashida Birch Washington of WXIR. Rashida killed it last year, uh, along with Wayo and El Poder. They hosted the most amazing in-person conference, the one we're remembering now is the good old days, um, and hope to get back to that point. But Rashida has been wonderfully helpful in passing along the knowledge she learned at the last conference to help us out um, with this one. And um, I would be remiss not to, no to notice the folks that aren't here this year. Um, in particular, Donna Diabanco. She was the uh, Donna Di Bianco, excuse me, uh, the radio goddess, as we all called her. Um, and it's um, just not the great grassroots radio conference without her. So I just want to take a moment uh, for us all to give up some love for Donna. Um, Ursula, are you on the call? because I believe Ursula is starting some sort of community radio fund in honor of Donna. So if you're interested in that community, you know, in that, contributing to that, talk to Ursula, please. Uh, we also lost Lorenzo Malam this year. And so many of us owe our radio stations to Lorenzo's revolutionary ways, his amazing uh, Bible of community radio, sex and broadcasting, that has nothing to do with sex, but everything to do with broadcasting and um, has really gives us all the tools we need to be great community broadcasters. So if you haven't read that book, uh, you definitely ought to. Jim Ellinger can hook you up with that and uh, any other Lorenzo Milan texts that you might need, but he was a true radio great, uh, true pioneer. Started, they called him the Johnny Appleseed of community radio and uh, traveled around the country starting many community radio stations. Um, and we thank him for that. So in closing, I just want to thank you all again for your patience, for your understanding, um, for just experiencing this with us, for embracing where we are now in this very strange time and, um, and just rolling with the punches and figuring out what we can learn from this, what tools can we gather while we're in this strange space that we can use to become better broadcasters in the future. It's a very self-reflexive time when we're we're kind of isolated and we're thinking about the world around us and we're recognizing that there's so many things that need to change. And while we're recognizing that, I hope that we're also recognizing how powerful we are as community broadcasters, how much strength we have in being able to communicate immediately with our entire communities. And it's important for us just to always remember that even when we're caught up in the day-to-day -day grind and the drama with the DJs or whatever it might be, we have to remember the bigger picture of our importance to our local community and then to our entire nation and potentially the entire humankind because every little ripple that we put out into the airwaves travels. We're affecting communities and they're affecting other communities and it's going on and on and on and on. So that's why it's so important that we're using our frequencies for the right reasons and that we're looking back on ourselves and the history of radio and seeing what things need to change and what things we can do to make ourselves a better society and make our listeners better people. We can literally change minds and save lives with our frequencies. And that's something that we need to remember as we go on from here. And we also need to remember that we're very powerful, each of us on our own, but we're even more powerful when we come together and when we can unify and we can do simulcasts or we can share information, that's when our power really amplifies and really grows and we can really shape this nation. So we're, we're getting into a very critical election and things we don't know. You know, we didn't know where we were going to be a year ago at the Grassroots Radio Conference, and now it feels like I don't know where we're going to be a month from now. 
but I do know that we will have our frequencies and we will have our voices, at least for a while. And we need to use them to the best of our ability at that time. And we need to think about what does our community need and how can we deliver that to them in the best ways. And I think, I just hope that you'll leave here with the tools you need to stay safe, and to stay loud and stay on the air and to stay immediate and to stay unafraid of what you have to say and what your community members need to say. And I hope that we can keep exploring and learning and embracing these new mediums and learning so much from this strange time that we're in right now so that when we finally all come together in person, it will be a great, wonderful moment and we can really celebrate and feel proud of everything that we've done throughout this very difficult time. So I just want to thank you all so much again for coming to the 2020 Grassroots Radio Conference Virtual Summit. You guys are amazing. I've loved seeing your faces and I can't wait to be together in person. So carry on, use your power well, and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Sharon, Sharon this is Ursula. Hi, Ursula. Hi, um, I was wondering if, um, I don't want to go into the Donna Fund too much in depth right now, um, but I was wondering since this really is the first conference without Donna, if I could read the bio I wrote with it, just to kind of give her a moment at the conference. Yes, please, Donna. Okay. I mean, please, sorry, Ursula, I'm thinking. <laughs> it's about okay, you can call me Donna. <laughs> She's channeling through you I'm right sorry. now. I can feel it. <laughs> okay, so this is, uh, I just want to, it's just a, uh, Real brief description of Donna. Uh, Donna DiBianco discovered community radio when she studied telecommunications technology at Santa Fe Community College in New Mexico. In the 1990s, in the early 1990s, she received hands-on training at KSFR at Santa Fe, New Mexico Community Radio, where she also held various management positions later on. And uh, later, Donna served as the operations manager for five years at Chaos Community Radio in Evergreen College in Olympia, Washington. And after working at Chaos, she worked as a radio building consultant, helping full power stations, including KHOI here in Ames, and many lower power stations get on the air and to uh, build up their operations. Donna was a friend and mentor for Pacifica Radio Network. In 2014, she helped Pacifica Network revive the Grassroots Radio Conference here in Ames with KHOI. She came and did a lot of work and she assisted subsequent conferences in other locations. Um, Donna's passing in April 2020 was a loss which was received with great sadness by her colleagues. A generous and thoughtful teacher, she focused on encouraging newcomers into community radio and her unflinching goodwill, her selfless enthusiasm, and her confidence in other people was about inclusion that embodied the essence of what makes community radio important. So I want to personally, you know, say goodbye to Donna here in this venue at, at, at the Grassroots Radio Conference and just, uh, you know, bring her into the conference for just a minute uh, as a last goodbye. Thank you. And, and it's true, we are uh, working on building a memorial fund to generate content, but I um, kind of legally, my ducks aren't in the row yet, so I'll, I'll um, announce that when it's more appropriate. But thank you for letting me give Donna a moment. She was a, a great personal friend to myself and to many people here. And thank you, Sharon, for a fantastic job and everybody at the conference. Thank you, Ursula, we've enjoyed it so much. It's really been a pleasure and that was beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Well, I, I would be glad to open it up if anybody had any further comments or ideas. Um, we generally do sort of a plenary about the next conference, um, which would be uh, welcome to do that, or we could uh, move on and save that for you know a reschedule another time. But I'd love to hear if you guys have um, ideas or thoughts or any feedback uh, for us on the conference. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, from Tom. Uh... Do, do we have a uh, station selected for uh, for next year's conference? And also, what is the status of the quilt as of today? That's a great question about, but actually both great questions. Um, I believe that, I, I, I don't know who got the quilt last year, actually. We don't have it. We would love to, <laughs> we would love to, but we don't. 
we didn't get it or the or the fund but i think that it's just because we just did it really we it's funny because we thought this was going to be we said we're not going to do the full conference but we really feel like we need to meet right now so we're just going to do a summit um and we thought it was just going to be this kind of brief a few talk about a few topics and then be out but it really obviously blew up and it became quite a big thing so we didn't we didn't actually ever ask for the fund or the quilt so we don't have either of those things for those of you listening that's kind of the existence of this conference is we pass on a small uh fund and a beautiful quilt from one station to the next each year and each station hosts it um to the best of their ability and so the, no there as far as i know it hasn't been decided um who gets the next conference uh, we would obviously love to have it in person if possible um but who knows what's gonna who knows what's gonna happen i guess maybe we can take a group picture if everybody turns on their video we can take a group picture of all of us maybe oh, turn that fun. into something yeah that'd be great i think the tech would have to just set it to gallery view and then somebody have to take a snapshot that'd be fun yay look at all those faces you all look amazing we you have, have to Take Two it pages. from three pages. I have three pages yeah. online. <laughs> sure, we can figure out a way to mail that together. Yeah, we can do that. There's always a way we can make it happen. Hey, Mary makes a way. <laughs> I'm going to say cheese. <laughs> Keep smiling one more. <laughs> <laughs> got to do two pages of it. You got everybody on two? Mine's on like I three. did, yeah, I've got two. Great. I've made my screen real big. Oh, you got a special situation. Well, I loved partying with everybody last night. It was so much fun. Thanks oh, that was, so, yeah. <laughs> Last that was amazing. We all needed to to bust a move a little bit, I think. <laughs> That's the one thing about this conference, a lot of sitting down. <laughs> I'm going to get of, up and take a walk after this. One of the things I think could happen is, um, you know, we don't have to decide right now what happens next. I mean, maybe we meet again briefly in a month or so to, to kind of keep tabs or, or keep it um in the discord or whatever um as we learn more about <laughs> what the future holds because we don't know that's the biggest complication in all of this is you just got to go and with the flow <laughs> yeah it's true we kept hoping we were going to be able to have it in person but just kept saying no i mean i think it's a brilliant idea for us to try to stay together and you know maybe you know, maybe a meeting in a month is a great way to keep everybody connected a little bit. Um, but unless anybody else has any other thoughts or if there's any other stations that want to volunteer. Well, I just want to say thank you to all, to you all. You've done a really wonderful job of pulling this together under really extraordinary circumstances. And I say that from the experience of uh, having uh, been a participant in organizing one or two of the previous conferences. So thank you all once again. And I really look forward to doing the next one. This is so much of a refreshing, a uh, group compared to the Pacifica Foundation, which I have the uh, dubious uh, <clears throat> We lost you, Tom. You muted. Yeah, your, your mic's muted. That unmuted now? Loud and clear. Okay, well, I don't know where we left off, but uh, again, I just wanted to thank you all for pulling this all together. Uh, it's been <clears throat> really brought up my spirit quite a bit. 
uh, from uh, the experience of being on uh, the Pacifica National Board, which is uh, <clears throat> really needs a dose of uh, this kind of enthusiasm to uh, pull Pacifica uh, out of the rut that it's in and move forward. And that's enough said, I think, by me. Well, thank you for your work with Pacifica, Tom. It's a very important part of American democracy. That's a, you know, critical organization and we wish you all the best and hopefully all the drama and the nonsense can go away and Pacifica can focus on being an amazing uh, community radio resource across the nation. Sharon, th this is Ursula. Um, one, one thing, uh, feedback I would have, it's not really a feedback, it's a request. Um, you know, there's been various theories and attempts to figure out how to create continuity with the GRC. And um, some of them work, some don't. But the, the thing that's really always important is that every time a, a venue does a conference, they become an alumni. And, um, and, and, and that collective, um, you know, uh, that collection of, of elders, so to speak, or alumni, is really the brain trust that helps the next station along. So any um, sort of documentation that you can pro uh, provide, especially because you've really pioneered a new way to do the conference and, and which is going to be around probably forever. Even, even when we can do in-person conferences, you kind of realized a dream that's been discussed for years and years and years, which is to make the conference you know, digital as well as in-person for all the people that can't travel. And so you've really pioneered that. And so any documentation your team can put together before you forget um, will be just invaluable to that, that brain trust that really keeps GRC alive. You, you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, Ursula. Thank you for that reminder yeah. because this is, there's a tendency to just be done with it and then move on, you know, but uh, yeah. it's so important. Well, I know everybody's, everybody's tired and you want to rest, <laughs> but that's like, that's like the moment that you, you just like, if you can push through just a little bit and write these things down, it would be a huge service to whoever comes next. Absolutely. And, and just on that same note, I really would hope that we could continue this. What's been so great about the virtual conference is having people from all over the world be able to, to participate. Doesn't matter their you know, activities at the station or their finances or whatever. And we've had people uh, participating from all around the world. So that's really exciting. And it's, I think it would be great to continue this even when the, the real conference begins again. Maybe we can do this sort of in the opposite part of the year or something like that. But I, I would definitely, we will share everything we've learned. Um, it was all trial by error. So if we can save anyone else the error, we're happy to. Hey Sharon, it's me, Kenya. Just hopping on to say congratulations. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. So cool to see you and Sean, even Max logged on and all of your, all of the people from WXOX. We have an amazing family. Great to see you. Um, but just such beautiful programming. So thoughtfully executed. I'm so psyched to be able to go watch the YouTube videos. It's so cool to see y'all stamp on it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for all your support and encouragement along the way. I might not have done it otherwise. <laughs> You're like, tell me, go get it. <laughs> so thank you. Great to see you. Great to see so many friends here. Um, we absolutely couldn't have done it without you all. And it's been fun. You know, it's kind of been fun to do it here at home. You know, you can go pour a bowl of cereal and come back and the next thing you know you're like in a conversation with Chuck D so it's been really amazing you know experience so I hope you guys have all had fun tuning in you know bringing us into your worlds for a little bit and again it's just so important that we stay connected um, we saw how powerful we were with the Brianna Taylor broadcast and how just playing that one song all we did was play one song together and the effect that that had on the community that the way that brought us all together, that way that it brought her heart out into the world and this quest for justice into the media, you know, it was just an amazing, really powerful moment. And, um, and it really just embodies what we can do with community radio. That was just one moment. And I hope and I encourage you all to think of other things we can do and use this network as a way to amplify those ideas. And I see Tia's on with us now. Tia, I wonder if you could just um, 
Unless someone else has any more comments. Any more questions or comments? I don't want to shut it down. I'd like to jump in a minute if I could. Oh, sure. Uh-huh. Go ahead, Anne. Good to see okay. you. At the 2016 Grassroots Radio Conference in Hot Springs, Arkansas, we decided to create a news up section of Audioport, and we thought we would be able to share news around the network. This didn't really succeed because there just aren't that many stations, I think, that have new newscasts uh, that they could plug um, this material into, uh, and not that many people who were therefore used to producing news. But now we have, a, well, some of us work on a broadcast called COVID Race and Democracy. And it's not just about COVID. It's, it's also about race and democracy. And we are really looking for contributions from the affiliates. Every, the show is once a week. It airs on WPFW, WBAI, and KPFT, and some affiliates. Thank you to Free Radio Moscow for giving, giving it a 9 a.m. Saturday slot. Uh, I put the, our Gmail address, and now I'm putting uh, our, our, our address uh, on the Pacifica.org side where all the, the archives are, so you can get an idea of what the show is like and how you might contribute. So if you have ideas, I mean, we're looking for news, feature segments, um, recordings from the streets where people are having protests, um, please engage. That's all. Please engage. Great advice. All our keynotes were so amazing. You all really just, I mean, that, that final keynote panel um, about diversity and inclusion, that was really powerful. And I hope that we can all take that and think about some of the things we learned there and continue to diversify the airwaves. Um, it's so interesting to me. I like to put a staff photo of like an old radio station. Whenever I do a staff meeting for our Facebook events, I like to pull up an old photo from some radio station in the past. And I, it's just so incredible and so shocking every time how they're all photographs of groups of white men. And so the fact that we are here and we have such diversity and we have so many different voices on the airwaves, that is, what Joseph Orozco said earlier in the panel, us being on the airwaves is our statement to the authority. It is our statement of power. And we need to make sure that we use that. You know, we have, sometimes I feel like with this radio station, I feel like that I've been given the ring. I've been given this power that I'm not always sure I know what to do with, but I do know that I have to keep it out of the wrong hands. I have to keep it away from Gollum. And that is my number one role as the station manager is to keep this frequency for the people and to keep it from getting taken up by these, these terrible forces of commercialism and whatnot that are trying to, trying to silence us. So we need to keep fighting. We need to stay together. We're so much stronger together and our voices are very powerful. Hey Sharon, may I just jump in for a second? Please do, Laura. Oh, it's actually Kate. Oh, hi Kate, I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't hear your no, voice right, it said Laura her, on this. Uh... I'm stealing her thing because um, my phone died. Um, I can tell I it's you, Kate, now. Hi, thank you. <laughs> Shortly before the conference started, we discovered um, this pretty amazing archive at IU the Archive of African American Culture and Music, or Music and Culture. I may be getting those backwards. Um, but they have an archive of Black radio, which is spectacular. And I feel like a lot of people may not have known about that, but it is amazing. And I just wanted to put it out there that if you're looking for archival stuff from Black culture starting in probably the 1920s, I know there are there are there are parts of the archive that are in the 1920s. Check it out; it's it's spectacular. Great, great tip. We've been finding great stuff in the Pacifica archives as well, and the from the vault section, a lot of raw material from the early civil rights marches, um, some speeches from some of the greats that aren't available anywhere else. So it's really interesting to dive back into the. The history of radio and pull out those gems. Um, Tom Voorhees has his hand raised. Tom? Did you already say what you want to say or?
No, I think I already covered okay. it probably too much. <laughs> that was from earlier. And while we're here, I definitely want to shout out to um, technical engineer Sean Selby here at WXOX. He thought uh, he was going to get to just enjoy the conference, but um, he ended up uh, live broadcasting many of your sessions here on WXOX. And many times it was like we were going on air in about one minute's time and he was just notified. So he really rolled with the punches with that and always does a great job keeping our station on air and helping us plan this event too. So shout out to Sean. Thank you, Sean, always. Any other voices out there want to say anything? So I was glad to see you all. And I would, I would really like to take Lori up on the idea actually of having a meeting again, maybe in a month's time. And we could email everybody on this list and we've got a big month obviously coming up and everything could be totally different on November 11th. It could be so much better or it could be um, worse than we ever imagined. So, um, <laughs> so let's, let's do plan to meet again sometime around November 11th, a month from now. I haven't looked at my calendar, so I don't know what days. Um, but I would really like to, to keep us in touch. And maybe that could even become a regular type thing. Because it's just so important for us to stay, stay connected. I miss you guys. <laughs> miss you all. Anyone well, else have anything to say? We have had a steering committee before. It was like, and I think this is, if we could revive it, that might be a positive. Let's do that. Ted, you're officially on the steering committee. I know we've actually talked about it. Ted Coast uh, Station KCSB. Did I get right? Santa Barbara, yeah. I had some Santa Barbara. Actually. This is uh, embargoed locally until Thursday, but we're a college and community station, and the readers of our local independent uh, arts and news weekly just voted us best radio station in Santa Barbara. So, yeah. oh, First no time I, I've worked there in 20 years. It's never happened before. Awesome. Congratulations, yeah. Ted. I see all the rainbows are around you. We're the parasite of the, lo of the local radio scene. That's <laughs> awesome. Here, yeah. That's huge. And may I love that radio station. I always love tuning in. You guys are doing a great yeah. job. Well, you guys are doing great too. So I've been very inspired. And I, you know, I went with, I have ties to the area. I wish I could have visited, but uh, yeah. yeah, I know. It really yeah. brought me home. And, and the more we communicate, I think, uh, like I you're proposing at the station level too, where people have resources for interviews and that kind of thing to, to think about those opportunities because we know a little bit more about communities like yours and hearing about Portland and yeah. Yeah. Country. Absolutely. Exchanging the sounds and information. Super important. Well, I really like the idea of the steering committee. Um, for, for those who are new to the grassroots radio conference, the steering committee is made up of, um, representatives from stations that have hosted the grassroots radio conference before. So Ted's station has hosted it before. I've talked to him about doing it. Um, I think I see someone from WORT on here. They've hosted it. I know there's some folks um, out in Humboldt. We all have hosted it. Ursula's hosted it. So I think that that would be a brilliant idea to uh, reestablish the steering committee and then figure out where we go from here. Anybody else have any other comments, thoughts, ideas? You want to save it till to the next meeting? <laughs> I, I do want Tia to close this out because she always has wonderful things to say about the power of community radio. And obviously, she's been a wonderful force uh, at our station, in our community, and also at this conference. So um, then unless anyone else has anything else to say, I'll hand it over to Tia. And thank you guys again for coming. Thank you all so much. Um, we've enjoyed this more than we possibly ever imagined. It's, it's been very powerful and meaningful. So thank you for joining us. Thank you, Sharon, for letting me say something to close us out. It makes me uh, happy to do that because this whole experience has just been an absolute blessing for me too. And I just, you know, I want to say first, thank you all so much for being here with us. And it was really wonderful to e-meet all of you all and engage in this exchange of information. It was just, like I said, an absolute blessing. Um, so thank you and I wish you well with everything that you do moving forward and all the energy and all the blessings that you need to stay strong through it. I also wanna give thanks to Beautiful Spirit the wonderful, for this wonderful and perfect energy flowing because of the knowledge passed between us, our community,
Just I'll... <laughs> look at Sean. What's up, Sean? <laughs> Just remember there's there's power in people, right? At the end of the day, that's why they work so hard to divide us. Remember, united we stand, divided we fall. Just like Sharon said, let's keep it together and let's keep building the community. Let's keep empowering the people. Much love to you all. And y'all can find me everywhere at Tia Marie Presents. Okay, <laughs> stay in touch. Let's be friends. Absolutely. Thank you all so much. Be looking for an email for a meeting and a gathering next month. Hope you all will stay in touch. And thank you again for coming to the 2020 Grassroots Radio Conference. We've really enjoyed it.